So this is, as you guys know, since we just covered it in our last chapter, this is the second feeding of the masses. The first time Jesus, he fed 5,000, this time he feeds 4,000. And there's uh, some fun lessons that go along with this one. And then we'll get into talking about the signs of the times and how Jesus basically castigates the people since they uh, were more interested in the weather than uh, basically knowing what time it was in the prophetic timeline that God had given them. So that should be fun. So let's start with verses 29 and 30. It says, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So when we look around our landscape in the present day, there are a lot of hurt people. I think we all, we all see that. We all notice that. You know, people who have been hurt by this world, people who have been crippled by the world, paralyzed by fear, uh, paralyzed by uncertainty, blinded by lies, blinded by greed, all of these kinds of things. And we often look at these people and we want to help them. You know, we want to just grab them and shake them by the shoulders and try to be like, what are you doing? You know, you need help. You need Jesus and get them to kind of snap out of it. You know, we want to explain to them why their life choices are wrong or why their relationship choices are wrong or their politics or their worldviews or whatever it may be. And you might even have some success when talking to people along these lines and trying to get them to, you know, change their worldviews or change their morality or their politics or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, not only is the gate narrow, but the way is narrow. We often miss that. We talk about the narrow gate, you know, the narrow way and the broad way. It's not just the gate, it's the way too. Jesus is the only way, but the Christian life, <laughs> it's not a comfortable Christian life. And we often forget that. We act like Getting saved is the finish line rather, rather than the starting pistol, you know, and we should rejoice. The angels rejoice. It's great to rejoice when people get saved and, and that's a, a huge thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's worthy of rejoicing, but it's not just the, the gate that's narrow. It's the way that's narrow. And the only way to fix the whole man is through Jesus Christ. You know, for many years when I was younger, I would talk to people about all the stuff going on in the world. I remember when I was young, before it was cool, you know, I was telling my buddies about the Illuminati and all this stuff, the Freemasons, and and that's, that's there's real stuff there, you know, there's, if you don't know that, there's a lot of conspiracies that are dark, and the people that run this world are not nice people, and they serve Satan. Because Satan's in charge for a minute. The Bible calls him the God of this age, the God of this world, with the little g, right? He's the usurper. God gave control to Adam and Eve, who promptly gave it to Satan in the garden. It's tragic. And so you got a lot of darkness in this world. And when I was younger, I would try to preach that to people and also preach Jesus, and I'd have some success. But uh, a lot more people would come away believing in the one and not the other. And that ain't going to help anybody because there's going to be a lot of people who are awake and conservative and moral, you know, and have the right politics that go to hell. That ain't going to help anybody. In fact, you're kind of putting those people in a bad spot because the most terrifying thing you can imagine is being a conservative the day after the rapture. You ever seen those pork? Pork is what's it's the other one, meat. It's what's for dinner. And that's, but you're for dinner. <laughs> Day after the rapture, conservatives, you're what's for dinner. So if you're giving people, you know, telling them about what's going on in the world, but not telling them about Jesus, you are doing them no favors. There's going to be a lot of conservatives in hell. Having the right politics won't save you. 
you know, being awake to what's going on, being red-pilled, whatever you want to call it. That's great, but that ain't going to help you when you stand before God. It's only half of the, it's only half the story. And so we got to be careful what our message is, what our, what our branding is, what we're preaching to people. Because only Jesus is able to fix people. Only Jesus can save the whole man. And you know what I've noticed? The weirdest thing happens when you give people Jesus, their politics, their morality, all these things, they change too. That stuff all changes if you're giving them the Jesus of the Bible. If you're giving them the woke, liberal Jesus preached at a lot of the churches nowadays, doesn't change anybody. But if you're giving them the Jesus of the Bible, people change. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul's going over the works of the flesh. And he's talking about all these horrible sins and homosexuality and all these things. And he says, and such were some of you. And yet, nowadays, you know, the average church, if someone comes in who's, you know, an unsavory character according to our, you know, worldview and these kinds of things, instead of looking at them as someone who needs Jesus, oftentimes we get this us versus them mentality and we want to chase them out. You know, God changes people. If we're willing to love the unlovable, if we're willing to give people Jesus instead of giving them the back of the hand, Jesus will change people. But we got to bring them to the feet of Jesus, just like what we see the people are doing here. These people didn't just come to Jesus and, you know, the analogy would be coming to church on Sunday morning or whatever and, you know, getting our fill. Wasn't that nice? Wasn't that lovely? And I probably won't be saying that here, but some churches in theory might be saying that after you go to those churches. But at the end of the day, it's kind of a moot point if we're not bringing our friends, our loved ones, the hurt, the maimed, the crippled, the blind to Jesus. We need to share the good news. And, you know, the good news isn't Klaus Schwab and George Soros and Bill Gates and all these characters. The good news is Jesus Christ. That's what's going to save people, right? So we want to make sure that that's our message. That's what we're known for preaching, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. <laughs> Bringing them to the feet of Jesus. Because that's the only place where there's actual healing for mankind. That's the only place where people get saved. Regardless of the diagnosis... The cure is the same. The cure is Jesus Christ. Take a look at verse 31. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now, as we've talked about before, one of the main things that Jesus did in his earthly ministry, and there were many things that he did, but one of the main things that he did is he lived the Christian life perfectly. He modeled for us perfectly how to live the Christian life. Because we can look at that as Christians and say, I want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? That's why we see Jesus get baptized, right? John the Baptist is like, dude, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus is like, suffer it to be so. You know, I got to have the model here so that people do the same thing. That's what's going on there. We see that again and again. And that's one of the reasons why we always see Jesus perform his miracles in such a way that makes it so that people don't glorify him, but rather they glorify God. Because Jesus is modeling for us how we're to live the Christian life. And that message was telegraphed loud and clear, and the church totally got it, right? Not so much. You look on, you know, YouTube, and you can see all sorts of miracle ministries and these well-known faith healers, snake oil salesmen, that are doing their thing on YouTube, and it's all about them. Benny Hinn and you know, all these guys waving their jackets and hitting people and out because I am. It's like some weird witchcraft going on up there. I have no idea where they got that from, but it's some spirit. It ain't the Holy Spirit. You know, and these people are doing these miracles, these scams almost always. You know, you can watch videos, exposés of all these different guys and it's all, it's all scams. And God does healing miracles all the time, but he does it when the focus is on Jesus Christ, not when it's on, 
healing miracles and these kinds of things, because then who gets the glory? You do. Aren't you amazing? You know, send a small donation to our ministry, and we'll give you a miracle prayer cloth. Who falls for this stuff? I don't know. People do it. These people are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's insane. But the focus should never be on us. The focus should never be on miracles. The focus should always be on Jesus Christ. And if you focus on Jesus Christ, then you will see incredible, awesome miracles. We've got five or six books at home. They're like little journals, and we call them the Book of Miracles. If the house was on fire, that would be the first thing we grabbed. You know, just the stories of the incredible stuff that God has done in our lives. And he does that because we don't focus on that. That's why every Sunday I'm not sharing a miracle out of the Book of Miracles. Because then you guys will be like, wow, Pastor Jason is so awesome. He's so not. He's so normal. And the focus always needs to stay on Jesus Christ. And if I stand up here and tell you guys all the amazing things that God does, then you'll be like, wow, isn't Jason awesome? No. No. Jesus is awesome. There can only ever be one name. And so, what are we going to focus on? Miracles? Are we going to do awesome things in such a way that glorifies us? Or in such a way that glorifies Jesus? Or in such a way that glorifies the church or our denomination? Or in such a way that glorifies Jesus? You guys know we do a homeless ministry. For the first, like, you know, two, three months or whatever it was, we didn't even have a banner that said our church. For this reason, we wanted the glory to go to Jesus. We only got one because people thought we were Mormons. And started getting around. They're like, heard you guys are Mormons. We're like, okay, banner time. <laughs> we got that banner real quick. <laughs> Homeless ministry, living faith, power, chapel. Jesus loves you. You know, the focus needs to always be on Jesus. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the only name that can receive the glory. God doesn't share his glory. You know, we pastors, we talk about the three G's. The three G's are what pretty much destroy every pastor that falls. Gold, glory, and girls. Oh, okay. Those are the things that destroy. <laughs> Where are you going with this? Yeah, it's, it's real. You know what the weirdest thing is? Everybody's pretty much cool if you reach out and touch the glory. Isn't that weird? But that's the one that's the most terrifying to God. That's the one that'll get you put on the shelf quicker than anything. Because God doesn't share his glory. And it's amazing how many, you know, I had a, a friend, more like a, a person that I knew, an acquaintance who was a pastor. I went on his website, I counted his picture 39 times on the website. I was like, what? I don't care how good you preach, bro. <laughs> it's the you show. I'm lucky I have a radio face, so I have no temptation to put my face in. If I could, I would put an emoji over my face right now. I would work for the Zoomers, but everybody else would. What are you doing? But at the end of the day, it can never be about us. It's got to be about Jesus. And it should never be about miracles or about the Holy Spirit. People are like, well, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God. Yeah, read John 16. What does the Holy Spirit do? Testifies of Jesus Christ. So if it's really a ministry of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be pointing not to himself. Literally says this, go read John 16. It'll be pointing to Jesus Christ. He always points to Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Points to Jesus. And yet nowadays there's all these ministries and, like air quotes, ministries that are focused on everything except Jesus Christ. I was watching one of the videos from Torben Sundergaard. He's one of these shucksters, one of these scammers. The guys that has his own compounds and tours and schools and properties and it reminds me of Gehazi. Don't look up Gehazi. Is it time for these things? No, it is not. But he has all these things and you watch the video. I was like 40 minutes into it. He hadn't even mentioned the name of Jesus yet. What? What are we doing? What are you doing? What's this about? It's about these things. It's about you. It's about me. It's about us. It can never be about us. It's always got to be about Jesus. He doesn't share his glory. The Bible says that again and again. That's actually one of the, you see it in Isaiah 40 through 50, several times mentioned there. He doesn't, I think it's 48, 11 and 43, 8. I can't remember. Don't quote me. But God doesn't share his glory. And those are some of the verses that make it very difficult for Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they say, well, Jesus is a God. He's 
you know, next to God. He's the co-God. Well, God doesn't share his glory. He says, I am God, I know of no other. There is none other beside me. Makes it tricky. God doesn't share his glory. That's why we can, it can never be about us. And that's why Jesus again and again models doing his miracles in such a way that makes people glorify the Father. And that's a good lesson for us. Whenever we're doing something for Jesus, we need to make sure that we're not reaching out and touching the glory. That it's not about us. God doesn't need help. It can only ever be about Jesus Christ. And if it ever becomes about anything other than Jesus Christ, God will tear it down. And if he doesn't, Satan will lift it up. And you'd rather have it be torn down than have Satan lift it up. And you look around the Christian landscape today, and there are a lot of ministries and churches and pulpits where the glory is flowing to them. And their face is on a big jumbo screen, and they got a little headpiece, and they're walking around all dynamic. And... What? That ever happens, just shoot me, okay? Just put <laughs> me out of my misery. If it ever becomes about anything other than Jesus Christ, then God will do a new thing. And the Spirit will be gone. That doesn't mean it'll stop. You want to see how far something can go without the Holy Spirit? Look at the Mormon Church. They got huge, beautiful temples all over this valley, and the Holy Spirit ain't there. So tragically, we wish every church would close that didn't have the Holy Spirit. But we talked about this, the tares and the wheat. The tares get separated from the wheat at the end. He allows them to grow together. But be very careful what the focus is on in any church, any sermon, any message you hear. Doesn't matter how good the person speaks or how beautiful the campus is. Campus, I'm like, I hated school. Why do they call it campus? That's why we don't call it Sunday school. We call it children's church. I hated school when I was a kid. Go to school another day a week? Like, oh yay, great. I don't get me started. But it's always got to be about Jesus. It can never be about anything other than Jesus. Always, only, ever Jesus. Take a look at verses 32 and 33. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have, com I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? <laughs> so this is hilarious. So remember, back in chapter, uh, fifth, uh, chapter 14, verse 15, you have the disciples and they come to Jesus. And they basically insinuate that Jesus isn't concerned about the people. <laughs> it's been a long day of ministry, you know, probably eight hours, ten hours. The disciples, they're like, all right, Jesus, you know, we got to we gotta send the people away. It's the day's late. They're acting like they care more about the people than Jesus. How funny is that? And that doesn't go so well, right? Jesus is like, all right. And he does the miracle, and then they're like, oh, well, Jesus didn't have to send the people away. He, says, he literally says that. He says, <laughs> they, they come to him and they say, it's late. We should send the people away. That's literally what they say. And Jesus responds and says, they do not need to go away. <laughs> so that's what happened last time. So this time, the disciples, they're kind of like, they're not going to say anything. Three days pass. <laughs> Jesus is like, all right, you guys did good. Good job. You didn't say anything. And then Jesus says it to them. He's like, yeah, I have compassion on the multitude, which is what they basically accused him not having last time. After three days. Yeah, you guys get upset when I preach for an hour. I see your eyes rolling back in your heads. There's people drooling. I have a really big Nerf gun, but I don't think you can bring toy guns on school property. So maybe when we have our own location. Just or you with a super soaker. No, I'm kidding. But think, it's three days. How funny is Jesus? How different are God's priorities than our own? We're like, oh my gosh, it's snowing outside. I didn't want to go to church today. It was really funny in Buffalo because you had six months of winter. You guys have no idea what winter is. You have six months of winter in Buffalo. It's snowing from November to April. We got a foot of snow in April. And so half the year, people are like, it's a blizzard. It's Antarctica outside. Like, I am not going to church. And then the other half of the year, people are like, it's finally not snowing. It's sunny. I can't go to church. 
So it was just like, there was always a reason to not go to church in Buffalo. People. So spoiled, right? But Jesus, he's waiting three days before he finally feeds the people. He's like, all right, I think I saw a couple of things. We'll feed them now. Think how different God's priorities are in terms of what really matters in this life than ours. We're thinking like, wow, you know, what we see how we think as humans back in the last chapter, chapter 14, where the disciples are like, Jesus, it's been a long day. We should, we should send him home. And this time they're afraid to say anything, so Jesus is just like, all right, let's, let's give it a shot. Three days in, Jesus is like, all right, I have compassion on the multitude. They've now continued with me three days. We read this and just gloss over it. Think how funny this is. It's been three days, Jesus is preaching to these people and healing and everything. Pretty amazing, right? I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint. <laughs> Probably pretty serious at that point. So Jesus is awesome. He's not looking at things the way that we look at things. We definitely do not look at things that way when it comes to uh, church and these kinds of things. And it's a very Western thing. You know, you look at what the church in most of the world goes through. They, you know, Nepal, they're like traveling over like glaciers and like, you know, falling into crevices. You know, in parts of Africa, they're grabbing Muslim extremists to literally burn down the churches with people inside. You know, in China, the underground church meets in the middle of the night. I was reading about one underground church group in Egypt where they all had a tattoo of a cross. And you had to have a tattoo of a cross to get in. Why? Because that means you're ready to die for it. And they didn't want secret police coming in and busting them. So unless you had that tattoo of a cross, you weren't getting in. Baptists would have been like, tattoo. <laughs> Missing the forest for the trees. So three days tick by when Jesus finally says something. And so Jesus kind of just tests them a little by basically just summarizing the situation. And then saying, and I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint. Which shows you how intense Jesus is when it comes to ministry. People are like on the verge of fainting. And it kind of puts things in perspective for us. How easy, how good we have it. You know, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, Forsake not the gathering together of the brethren, and especially all the more as you see the day approaching. And here we are, we see the day approaching. And the, the atmosphere, the environment when Paul wrote that was one of Christians being executed. So there was real palpable danger to go to church. And now we have a little taste of that, and we see that 30% of Americans completely have stopped going to church over a virus that has a 99.99 whatever percent survival rate. They would have been, the early church would have been baking for a 99.99% survival rate. And we stopped going to church. We give up. I think they were saying like a third of the churches in America have closed over the past two years. I think that's great. A lot of them needed it close. But, you know, if God's in it, he'll make sure it's not closing, right? Isn't that funny? God's like, yeah, go start a church in the middle of the road app. I'm like, yes, sir. It's a great idea. <laughs> but if God's in it, and if God's real, should we be worried about these kinds of things? You know, you look at China where they're still going to church, even though they're going at two in the morning to hide from the secret police and everything. And you look at that, and those people are on their social credit score system, and they can't bank, they can't go on high-speed rail, they can't have their kids go to college, nobody will marry their kids. They're ostracized from the community because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Are we willing to do that? Because those systems are being put in place right now. We've showed it, you guys who go on Wednesday nights, you know what I'm talking about. We showed the article uh, three weeks ago where it says your browser history may soon determine your credit score. Yeah, and your church attendance and everything else. Are we willing to put up when it's time, or are we going to shut up? We'll have a chance to put that into practice real soon. But Jesus definitely isn't on board with fluffy little comfortable 30-minute sermons. And Yesterday someone was asking me what I thought about a certain local church, and I... I said, well, I tried to listen to one of the sermons, but it was the same I always get. Two stories and a joke, or two jokes and a story. 
And this is the formula, this is what they tell you to do because God's word's not exciting enough. So we gotta give you a couple stories and a couple jokes. Are we entertaining goats or feeding sheep? A lot of churches are entertaining goats and they got a conveyor belt and as long as you throw a little money in the box, you're good to go. They'll bring in the next group of people and hope they throw some money in the box. What? How, how did this happen? How did we get here? Tragic, terrifying. God's not a joke. And Jesus, he gives us that image pretty clearly right here when we see how he looks at ministry compared to how we look at ministry. Jesus didn't have two stories in a joke. That's why I don't have two stories in a joke. Why was full of stories? Why do we need to tell more? It's like, it's like it's, you're reading a story here. Like, how many stories do you need? Call them skyscraper sermons because it's just all story after story after story. And I'm not sure if the disciples here are caught up in the moment or what, but it's amazing how quickly in our own lives we as Christians forget the countless times in the past where God has made a way where there was no way. Because look at what they say. Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? This is one chapter ago when Jesus just did this same thing. They've already forgotten. We joke that a pastor's conference is a bunch of guys who know the answer getting together to remind each other of the answers that they already know. You ever get the feeling that's what Jesus is doing? He just did this same thing like a couple weeks or months or whatever earlier in the narrative, right? And now here he is. It's like, ah, I don't want them to faint. And the disciples are like, where would we get all this bread? And Jesus is just like, all right, back to the drawing board. That's you. That's me. That's how we are, right? God carries us through some great trial where we're just on our knees, pouring out our heart to the Lord. And God comes through and we're like, all right, you know, we're... We're there at that mountaintop experience. God is so amazing. Just did the awesomest miracle. And two weeks later, you know, same little pickup. And we're just, we lose it. You know, you think of Elijah with the prophets of Baal. He's killing them all on the mountaintop. Just like the nature. It's just like, chop it up, guys. And then, and then Jezebel's like, I'm going to get you. And he's just like, ah, loses it. He's just freaking out. God has to bring him lunch from a bird is hiding in the wilderness. We don't learn the lessons, do we? And then, we, like we talked about, Jesus is like, alright, let's play this level again. Where are we going to get the food? Jesus is like, I don't know, where did we get it last time? And that's it. That's our own lives. That's us. We laugh, but that's what we do, right? We, we again fall flat on our faces. We miss the point of the lesson, and then, of course, we have to play that level again. And eventually, hopefully, uh, we get tired of Groundhog Day, and we actually learn the lesson that God's trying to show us as he allows us to go through these situations. And it's funny, I was talking to my wife last night about this passage, and it was like, she, she's funny, she's like, well, the first time there was 5,000 people, it looks like you lost about 1,000 by hanging out three days. <laughs> a bunch of people are like, all right, time to get home. Maybe only 4,000 this time. But that's pretty good. 80% were just willing to stay till the end. I wish we had those numbers at church. That'd be amazing. People are willing to stay for a three-day sermon. I'm pretty sure I'd be alone after like two hours here. I love you guys. You guys are gluttons for punishment. You Sit in an hour sermon, most churches are 30 minutes. So, take a look at verses 34 through 36. Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, and broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. And like we talked about while covering uh, this passage last time, Jesus did this miracle. It's not about how much we have to offer. It's about what we're willing to do with it. I'm sure as you guys have sat in churches and, you know, listened to sermons, I'm sure you've had that feeling like, what is God doing picking these pastors? 
I know. I'm nothing special, so I'm, I'm me too. You know, I'm I'm nothing special. He's scraping the bottom of the barrel. But it's important to recognize that it's not about ability so much as it's about availability. You know, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. There are, I'm sure, people that would do way better preaching than me and most of the other pastors you see. But they're too busy doing life their way. And it's not about how talented you are, because then who gets the glory? You do. You're so awesome. You're such a great speaker, or whatever it may be. In our hands, it's a little. But in God's hands, it's enough. It's not about ability. It's about availability. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. It's not about how gifted you are. It's about how yielded you are. It's not about what we have. It's about what we do with it. And that goes for all aspects of the Christian life. You want to be used by God, give your life to him in the fullest sense of the word. I think of the passage, uh, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, where it talks about if you want to know the good and perfect will of God, then you got to commit your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Then you'll know the good and perfect will of God for your life. If, and practically speaking, if you want to be used by God, I, the analogy I use is a cup. Right? If you go into the kitchen, are you going to grab a cup that's full? No, right? So if you're full of doing your own thing in life, God's not going to grab that cup and use it. Are you going to grab a cup that's dirty? No. You're not going to go grab the nastiest cup you can find. You're going to grab the cleanest cup you can find. So if you've got sin in your life, don't expect God to grab that cup and start using it. Are you going to grab a cup that's far away from you? Are you going to go to your neighbor's house and grab a cup? No, you're going to grab a cup that's close to you. So you want to be used by God and be close to God. All these things make perfect sense. We do the same thing every single day when we go and try to find a glass to use in the kitchen. And, you know, it's, your wife doesn't have time to do the dishes because your kids are insane. So you're looking around. You're like, where is the cleanest cup? And that's kind of where we are right now at the end of time. God's scraping the bottom of the barrel. The dishwasher has not been run, ran in a long time. So he's like, all right, it's pretty horrible, but it'll work. And that's where we are. So you're wondering why all the pastors are a joke nowadays. You're right. It's just this is the end of the world. I don't know what to say. There's a 1-800 number you can't call. But if you want to be used by God, give your life to him in the fullest sense of the word. And he will use you. Here I am. Send me. Says no one ever anymore. But if you do that, God will do awesome things. God will give the increase. All you have to do is present your... Your life is a living sacrifice. Present your, your loaves and fish to the Lord, and then he will do an awesome thing. He'll use his disciples to reach the others. Here's the question. Are you giving the people in your life what God has given you? Because isn't that what happens right here? Jesus gives this stuff to his disciples who then give it to the people. You guys are his disciples. Are you giving what he's given you to the people that he brings into your life? That's where the application is. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are you living it out? If you're not, then you can't complain. Take a look at verse 37. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. And this was probably the first, and for most of the people, last time in their lives where they were able to eat their fill. Remember, they had the Roman boot on their neck. They didn't exactly have plenty and abundance. So this was probably the first time in their lives that these people were able to eat until they were full. What a cool thought, right? And the disciples here learn that you can't outgive God. We've tried. Not happening. If you give him your life, he'll give you back a better life. If you give him your time, he'll add he'll add joy to your days. He'll add fullness to the time that you have. 
What's the saying? He'll add life to your years. God is a debtor to no man. They gave Jesus a grocery bag full of food and they got back a shopping cart full of food, right? And everyone was full. God can take nothing and do something with it. That's the story of every Christian ever used by God. The truth is only Jesus is ever truly capable of filling you up in this life. Can't remember which one of the quarterbacks it was. I'm so not into sports. It's simulated warfare. Why do you need simulated warfare? You're in a real battle. Did you know that? Like, you're in a battle. Instead, you watch simulated warfare so you can ignore that you're in a real battle. All your wives are nudging you. Yeah, well, it's true. And the girls, you guys are just as bad, so don't even get me started. No, I'm kidding. You're worse. No, I'm kidding. I'm so kidding. Oh, man, I'm getting in trouble. Oh, yeah. I make friends left and right. No, but seriously, this life, it doesn't fill you up. There was some quarterback, and he had just won the Super Bowl or whatever it was, and he was just like, this is it? This is it? I can't remember. Troy Aikman? Yeah. The Cowboys or whatever, right? They used to be a good team right here. And so he had won the Super Bowl or whatever it was, and he was in his hotel room, and he's just like, this is it, this is it, like, I thought that would make me happy. You hear the Olympians saying the same thing after they win the gold medals, or, you know, the, the famous people that, I, th I think the classic example is Alexander the Great, right? He was like 27 years old or whatever it was, and he had conquered every nation on earth, and he was weeping uncontrollably in his tent, because there was no people left to conquer. And so he got smashed and went out in the snow and died. Great. Yeah. Nice plan, bud. But that's it. That's where this world leads you. This world's empty. None of this stuff's going to satisfy you. You think getting rich, getting that house, getting that promotion, what, you think any of that's going to make you happy? If that was the case, then why are the countries with the highest GDPs also the highest suicide rates? That doesn't make sense. You'd think it would be the poor people who are doing really bad, who have the highest suicide rates. No. No, those countries have the lowest suicide rates. It's us, because we're so comfy. It's all too easy. There's a real battle going on. Join the battle. It's an exciting life. Christian life is so exciting, it's incredible. You read the, if it's not, you're doing it wrong. Go read the book of Acts. It's an adventure. It's the craziest adventure ever. You guys, some of you guys who have heard our testimony, we, when we first went out as church planting missionaries sent out from the campus church to the Bible College, we got to Buffalo, New York. We moved into a Motel 6, had never stepped foot in Buffalo, New York, had only one family that someone had given us their phone number. We'd never met them. We were like, hey. <laughs> we talked to them, and they were the first people that went to our church, and they were leftover from a previous church plant, we actually found out that a dozen attempted church plants had happened in Buffalo and they all failed. Like disastrously, with like SWAT team raids on houses. It was amazing. And so we are there in the hotel and we find a place to rent and we go sign, I go to sign the lease, the guy smells like booze and we end up talking for like an hour and then it turns into like three hours and then six hours. And by the end of the day, it was like eight hours in, I was talking to this guy. In the middle of the conversation, he grabs a loaded 45 and puts it to his head, and we're wrestling over a gun. Yeah, Christian life is super boring, guys. You should totally not just binge Netflix. That's way more exciting. The Christian life is an adventure. Give God a blank check, and you will have the craziest adventure. And it won't be comfortable. It's going to be awesome and horrible and great and tragic and everything all at the same time. But it won't be boring. You can never say it's boring. You can't outgive God. And that's here what the disciples see, right? They get back a huge shopping cart full of fragments of bread. And then take a look at verses 38 through verse 1. It says, Now those who ate were 4,000 men, those who stayed three days, besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. Isn't this cute? Jesus, all he does is go, go around doing insane miracles. And they're like, show us a little trick. I don't know, I'm pretty sure just in principle, 
you wouldn't, right? Just because they're like, obey me, do this little thing for me. Wouldn't that just, I don't know, I'm thinking Jesus is probably like, no, <laughs> no. Nah, nah. That's pretty much what he says. It's basically, they're basically like, submit to us. Do this little thing for us, to show us. How many miracles did they see? Think about it. At the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry, before he had done many miracles, we have Nicodemus come, and he says, we know you're from God. They already knew he was from God. We have the parable of the wicked vineyard workers, the wicked vineyard dressers, right? Or they say, this is the son, let's kill him and seize on the inheritance. They knew who he was. They just didn't like him. Because he didn't play their rules. He didn't, he didn't play by their, their rules and play their little games. Do a trick for us and maybe we'll give you our stamp of approval. It's very much like what you see when Satan tempts Jesus and he says, throw yourself off the top of the temple. Then everyone will approve of you and say, oh, you're the Messiah. Take a different path to receive the kingdom. Do a little trick for us, Jesus. Then you won't have to go to the, the cross. Then you, we'll tell the people that you're the Messiah then. We're the religious leaders. We can, we're the gatekeepers to the people. Do what we say. And you can have the people. You see how subtle it is? Terrifying, right? They knew who Jesus was. And yet... God in his graciousness, you get to Acts chapter 15, and there's a sizable, a sizable contingency of the, the Pharisees who became Christians in the early church. Isn't that crazy? God's mercy. The terrifying part is there were no Sadducees ever recorded as being saved. They didn't believe in the supernatural. Terrifying, huh? So look at Jesus' response, uh, response in verses 2 through 4. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather, today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Ouch. Uh, that's going to leave a mark, right? So they ask for a uh, sign, and instead they get a slap. And the first thing we want to mention here is how this verifies Jonah. I can't remember, it was some friend that they have an unbelieving spouse, and the, the unbelieving spouse, or it wasn't even a spouse, it was just an unbelieving person in their life that was like the father of their child, and they were reading a Bible story. And it was Jonah, and the person was like, this is ridiculous. Who believes this stuff? Jesus did, right? Because here Jesus is talking about Jonah. Like Chuck Missler used to always joke, if you don't believe in Jesus, you got bigger problems than whether Jonah happened. In the April 4th, uh, 1896 edition of the Literary Digest, it tells the story of a guy named James Bartley. He was on a whaling expedition. He got swallowed by a whale. They later killed the whale and recovered him, and he lived. Except he was bleached completely white by the stomach acid, and all his hair was removed. And now you know why everybody got saved when Jonah came into the end Because they were like, ah! He's like, repent. They're just like, ah, I'm doing what this guy says. He looks insane. But the point Jesus makes in verses 2 and verse 3 Highlights the phenomenon that we still see today. How many of you guys know how much easier it is to talk about the weather with some random person than it is to talk about Jesus coming back? Everybody's willing to talk about the weather. Oh, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's whatever, right? Whatever it is. They're always complaining about the weather. And yet you try to talk to people about Jesus, man. You try to talk to them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It comes the end of the world. And eyes roll back in their heads. Oh, here we go again. One of these crazy religious people. It's a lot easier to talk about the weather. Why? Because there's no accountability with the weather. Talking about the weather doesn't mean you can't keep getting drunk or cheating on your spouse or whatever it is you're doing. There's no accountability when it comes to talking about the weather. But if you're talking about a God who is going to come back and judge the living and the dead, there's some accountability with that one, huh? That one's got some teeth. 
So people don't like to talk about that. It's not comfortable. There's a judgment coming. God's going to come back and bring every act into judgment. He's going to judge the living and the dead. There's a personal accountability in that message. It forces each and every person to make a decision. What are you going to do with Jesus? Man, it's an uncomfortable thought if you don't have Jesus, huh? So you just try to push it out and ignore that. Jesus is saying, you look at the clouds and you can, you can figure out the weather, but you can't connect the dots on all these events coming to pass right before your eyes. And it was true in his day, and it's true in our day. Don't forget, at the time of Christ, you had Daniel 9, verses 24 and 25, right? The 70 weeks prophecy, and you do the math, and it, you guys know, it gives you a mathematical uh, time date specific prophecy. It says, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince... And it gives you math and a mathematical formula. You do it and it gives you 173,880 days. And you know the day that was the command was given by Artaxerxes Longinomus. It's in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 8 I think it is. But it's also in secular history. So we know it was March 14th, 445 BC. And then you count forward 173,880 days. And you adjust for leap years and all that. And it brings you to the exact day of the triumph entry. When Jesus says, if you only recognize this your day, because he told them the exact day. Can't tell the signs of the time, but you can tell the weather. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And it wasn't just that. Think of John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, right? He's going through his 24 course rotating journey through the priesthood, it's his turn to go in, he goes in, the angel says, your son, John the Baptist, he's going to be the herald of the Messiah. Meaning the Messiah is coming, your son's going to herald him. You don't think he went and told all the other priests? Hey, my son's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. You have the shepherds, who got the birth announcement, as it were, right? When they watch the angel serenade them, you don't think those shepherds who kept the Awasi sheep that were used in the temple sacrifice, you don't think they went and told the people who bought those sheep, the temple authorities? Hey, we just saw the Messiah. Think about the wise men. They come into Jerusalem and Herod is troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Because they say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And what does Herod say? Where is the Messiah going to be born? Ask the religious leaders. Church, should they have known that the Messiah was there? Absolutely. They had no excuse whatsoever. Did they miss it? Better believe they missed it. But even the, you know, even the Samaritans are like, could this be the Messiah? We talked about last week, the Syrophoenician woman, and she's like, son of David. They understood who he was, but the religious leaders, they're like, nah, nah, I don't like this guy. All the evidence, and they missed it. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, and the exact same thing is happening right now before our eyes. In slow motion. Isn't that tragic? 70% of the Christians in the world don't even believe in a rapture. Over half the Christians don't even believe Jesus is coming back. Amillennialists, preterists, they don't believe Jesus is coming back. Calvinists, they don't believe it. We talk about it every Wednesday night. Everything Jesus told us to watch for, it's all coming to pass. Got the technology converging around the world, preparing to go inside of our hands and foreheads. Israel's putting the finishing touches on their plans to rebuild the temple that one day Antichrist will stand in and declare himself to be God. Got mankind on the verge of achieving immortality and merging with machines. We call it the fifth industrial revolution, merging man with machines. You got the Arabs for the first time in human history making peace with the Jews. Exactly at the same time when the non-Arab Muslims are all forming the exact alliance the Bible says will take place at the end time between Russia, China, Turkey, Iran, and the North African countries. All happening right out of the Bible. The Bible says it happens at the end of time. While the Jews are all coming back from around the world to go into Israel where the Bible says they have to be at the end times. It's all happening. And the church is 
Excited to see Jesus return? Nope. The church is asleep at the wheel. And if you dare talk about this stuff, man, you will be ostracized. Apostasy is happening in mass all around the world. It's all the historical Christian denominations are walking away wholesale from the teaching of the Bible. And every form of wickedness, every form of corruption is now welcomed in the church. The great apostasy. Doctrines of demons. And it's even creeping into our own movement. Rapture fatigue. Calvary Chapels 20, 30 years ago, all of them were talking about Jesus coming back, all of them were excited about it. Now, you don't hear a peep about it. Now we're woke, like a lot of Calvary's. Teaching critical race theory and all this garbage here in town, Calvary Chapels. It's tragic. Hear these guys, some of them saying, Jesus might not come back for a hundred years. Well, then the Bible lied. Because Luke 21, at the end of Luke 21, the Bible says very clearly that the generation that sees these things begin to happen will see all of it take place. Right? It says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, your redemption draws near. Not when all this stuff is finished, then, you know, maybe. Maybe the rapture then, you know. Compares it to a childbirth. When it starts, it doesn't stop. That's what childbirth's like. <laughs> Nobody begins laboring and has the baby six months later. Makes God a liar because he says the generation that sees these things begin to take place won't pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And he says when we see these things begin to come to pass, look up, your redemption draws near. And yet most churches, even in our own movement, are going about their business like nothing's even happening. They've got 20-year building plans and you know, expansion plans and all these things. And Church, this is how the world ends. If what the Bible says is true, and I promise you it is, you don't have 20, 30 years. Because all this stuff right now is ramping up on a level that you, there is no going back. We've passed the point of no return. If you look what's going on in the world right now, if you look at the state of technology, if you look at the spiritual decline, if you look at everything, it's all falling into place. you got Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, coming out in 2016 saying within 10 years of 2016, we're all going to have injectable health passes, implantable health passes. How many know about health passes in 2016? Question, church, are we right on schedule for that? Right on schedule. Switzerland, I think it was Switzerland, Sweden, they just started rolling out the microneedle vaccine. Remember we were saying that was coming? ones that use luciferase, quantum dot microneedles. They're calling them the next generation of COVID vaccine. Like it all just magically happened. Oh yeah, we haven't been planning on this for a while, no. <laughs> We're watching birth pains right now. This is the beginning of sorrows. Things are not going back to normal. Until Jesus opens up the sky for his church. So what should we do? Warn everybody. It's the end of the world. Go move out into the hills. Send your friends a bunch of videos about all the stuff going on in the world. If they're Christian, sure. But if they're not Christian, give them Jesus. That's what people need. Jesus Christ. We should be doing what the people did in this morning's text. Where they brought the, the crippled, the lame, the blind. They brought them to Jesus. That's the plan. Because there's going to be a lot of Christians who have no idea what was going on who are going to be saved. And they're like, wow, that's cool. But there's going to be a whole bunch of people who know what's going on who aren't going to be saved. And they're going to be like, wow, that's not cool. So let's make sure we're doing the same thing that people are doing here in this morning's text. Bringing the people to Jesus. Knowing the signs of the times, knowing when we're living... Having a good understanding of what's going on so we can wake up our fellow believers. But that should only be a message for our fellow believers. 
And that's why on Wednesday night we talk about these things, to wake up the church. And to just be able to speak into this narrative, since there's so many people just like Googling this stuff on YouTube and trying to find truth. And we've actually had people get saved just watching our, our Wednesday nights where we talk about all this stuff. But the main purpose is to try to wake up the church so that the church goes out and gives the gospel to their friends and family. And so I hope that's what this encourages you to do, what you see them doing here in this morning's text. Bringing the crippled, bringing the blind, bringing those paralyzed, and man, there's a lot of people paralyzed by fear right now. Bringing them to Jesus. Because he's the only one that can fix what's broken. And he will. And he's doing it. And we're seeing lives change and people get saved, and it's awesome. You're in the battle. Make sure you're fighting it. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for this reminder that you give us in your word that it's all about bringing people to you, Lord, that it's not about what we have or how much we have, Lord, it's about what we're doing with it. So, Lord, help us to use whatever you've given us, Lord, in this life and help us to give it right back to you so that we, so that we can then take what you've given us and give it to those who you bring into our lives. Help us to share the good news with our friends, our family, our co-workers, everyone that you bring into our paths. Help us to be bold for you, Lord Jesus. Because you were bold for us. You went to the cross despising the shame. Now you sat down at the right hand of the Father, Lord, but we know you're not staying there forever. You tell us you'll come again. And Lord, we know that day is coming very soon. As we look around the world and we see the signs of the times all around us. So, Lord, help us not to be like the generation that existed on the earth when you first came. Help us to not be asleep at the wheel. Lord, even though we're a tiny little remnant and it says all the virgins are sleeping, Lord, let our little band be awake with our eyes wide open, knowing what's coming next, so that we can give all the people that you bring into our lives the good news, that you love us. That you lived the perfect life and died on the cross to save us. And that you rose again from the dead, proving it's all real. And you're coming again soon. So help that to be the message that's on our lips, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. We're so thankful to see what you're doing. Continue to use us for your glory to build your kingdom. We love you, we praise you, we worship you. Bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now in Jesus' name. Amen. Reaching